as far as the rest of Bears training camp is concerned, we've we've heard all about offensive install. It's a good thing, I guess, for three days that the rookies are there earlier than the veterans. What is a reasonable expectation as to how training camp should go based on what we should see, at least for the first few weeks of this season? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some stops and starts with the new system, even if Caleb Williams got a jump on it and he's had a lot of time to kind of digest what the details of it are. That's how it works. You have a defense that is pretty much coming back fully intact, even if you have a new defensive coordinator, and you have an offense that has had a lot of new, important component pieces. You have a new offensive coordinator, you have a new quarterback, you have a couple of new receivers. So I wouldn't be surprised if it looked uneven for the first couple of weeks because that's just kind of how it goes, especially when you have a lot more continuity on one side of the ball than the other. Are you as concerned as I am? I have been, and I haven't discussed this in a while, but I have been, the Bears need a good center guy for a while now and they got a couple guys who've played the position but neither one strikes me by pedigree and history as an absolute certain number one center whether it's Shelton Coleman or Ryan Simmons and either one of these guys they're guys they're they're NFL guys is that okay I think it's okay if you have you know quality starters at the other spots. And I honestly think depth and options is the most important thing. And that is what they have on the interior. If Coleman Shelton ends up getting the starting center Coleman job Shelton. and they eventually need Ryan Bates to slide in because they're not getting what they need out of Nate Davis, I think that's acceptable. Uh, there's absolutely a world where they could have upgraded in a more pronounced way there, either spent more in free agency or tried to chase it in the draft. And I would completely understand that. But I think it's more about having five functional pieces up front and being able to sustain some injuries to maintain those five functional pieces. I think that's what they prioritize this offseason and adding multiple bodies to that spot. And I think that's probably what they're going to get. You know, you just don't want to be in a situation like we have been over the last couple of years where you have unplayable guys at a couple of those interior spots. And I think because of the moves they've made this offseason, there's a good chance they're going to be able to avoid that. We know you're a Bears fan. So where do you sit with this as far as the hope, especially knowing how you felt in 2021 when the Bears also previously drafted a quarterback in the first round and now? It feels a lot different just because that was a desperation move. That was a move where you're trying to salvage the position and guys are trying to salvage jobs. And we knew that they were going to have to drop him into a terrible situation. I mean, that roster, anyone who was paying attention knew the bottom was about to fall out of that thing. That was one of the worst rosters in the NFL when Justin Fields got there and then over the last couple of years on the offensive side of the ball. This is a completely different set of circumstances on so many different levels. This is not the fourth quarterback taken in this draft. This is somebody that was projected to be the number one pick for multiple years because he has a rare skill set. What he is bringing to the table is not something you see from a lot of young quarterbacks on multiple different levels. And that's just what he's doing. And then you extend that to the supporting cast this is a really good group of players for a rookie quarterback to join, let alone the number one overall pick. They have spent the last couple of years building this up to make sure that if they were ever going to move on from Justin Fields and drop someone else in there, that that guy was going to be set up for success in a way that Fields was not and in a way that rookie quarterbacks typically aren't. And I think that's exactly where we are. Even if there are elements of this that are kind of meh or slightly underwhelming, you don't love Shane Waldron, whatever, it is inarguable that this guy has much better surroundings than we typically see for young quarterbacks in this situation. Okay, with that in mind, I've been kind of gaming this out in my head a little bit just based on Bears history. Bears, wh- wh- any level of quarterbacking prospect, and the way this city thinks about football, what's sort of in our DNA when it comes to having a good defense, which I think the Bears have. I'm even mm-hmm. even without a, a, a certain three technique. I think the Bears are going to have a good defense, maybe a really good defense. So at any point, and if so, when do we get to the inevitable? Well, if. Caleb, he's trying to be too spectacular. He just needs to manage the game. Is and, and my belief is if you draft Caleb Williams and it's a generational talent, at no point do I want to hear that that Chicago backsliding because it's our nature. We do that. We're like, oh, he threw another interception. This defense is so good. He doesn't have to take all these risks. If he could just manage the game, we'll be fine. 
we did a show last week. I did a show with Courtney Cronin from ESPN who covers the Bears. And we were talking about how many teams can win the Super Bowl. And I look back over the last decade at the teams that made the conference championship game. So 10 years, four teams apiece, 40 teams. Of those 40 teams, 35 of them were top 10 in passing efficiency in the NFL. Efficiency. Efficiency. Okay. But and if you look at it, they were top 10 in offensive efficiency and often passing efficiency. That is the world we live in now. If you want to be a contending team in the NFL, you need to have an elite passing offense. You can't have an elite defense with an average offense that gets you by. Those days are gone. And I think that that change in mindset is probably healthy for a lot of people in this city as they think about what sort of team they want to build. The quickest path to consistent contention is having a very good offense. Defense is so fickle and it's so unreliable as you get deeper into the year and you play better quarterbacks. This is all about trying to build the best offense you possibly can and build the defense that is complementary to what you're doing on the other side of the ball. We know and that. It's important to switch See, into that. <laughs> I know you know you know that. Everything you're saying is 100% correct, but that's it's still not the way Bears fandom writ large. Maybe maybe I'm just wrong, but per my experience it always gets back to this this tighten it down you know win with defense don't make mistakes conservative conservative and and this idea of your 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 gunslinging quarterback well that's that's not the way to win even though of course it is also they have the bears haven't won recently with that like the nfl changed robert also points that out in his podcast typically end with us but you're right that is the thought process and even now the way we describe the team as you know is well, the defense really improved last year. And it did really improve last year. And having a good defense is extremely helpful, right? If you look at teams that typically go far in the playoffs, they don't have bad defenses. I mean, Kansas City's defense last year was elite. The Niners' defense last year was very good. Mm -hmm. Baltimore was in the AFC Championship game in large part because they had the best defense in football. You need to be good on both sides of the ball. But offense needs to be the priority these days and setting your quarterback up for success needs to be the priority. And I think that's what the bears have done. And this isn't about having a guy go out there and you know play wild football. And Josh Allen, even with the interceptions that he throws, he doesn't take any sacks. He adds so many, he adds so much value in quieter parts of the game. And Mahomes, even if you can watch him and people think that there's a spectacular kind of volatile nature to his game, that's not true at all. I mean, he has fewer negative plays than pretty much anyone playing the position. He takes so few sacks. He's very conservative with the football in terms of where he's putting it. So I think there is a way to have one of these modern quarterbacks who can do more things out of structure and be creative, but still not lean into a lot of negative plays. We see that consistently with the best quarterbacks in the league. And I would hope that Caleb Williams eventually gets, if not to that level, then something close to it. Do you think relative to the rest of the division, which has also made a lot of moves recently, that the Bears have done enough to make themselves a playoff team? Yes, I absolutely do. I think that they there is a world where they absolutely can get one of those wild card spots. It's not going to be easy because I do think that Detroit and Green Bay are still better positioned. You know, I think that the Packers and the Lions are Super Bowl contenders this year. I don't think the Bears are there you know, for a lot of different reasons, and that's okay. You know, they have a rookie quarterback and a first-year offensive play caller. So I think that it's going to be tough sledding because the division has a lot of quality pieces in it. But there's absolutely a path forward for this team as a wild card. If you can be an above-average offense, and that's asking a lot from a rookie quarterback, but I don't think it's impossible considering the situation. And the defense can be a borderline top 10 unit in the way that it was last year, I absolutely think that this can be a 9-10 win team if things break correctly and they can be competitive all year. Robert, I don't usually get hung up too much on scheduling, but this year is notable in that those division games that you mentioned for them are packed toward the back end of the schedule. So that gives us increased injury variance. When we know that either the Bears or their opponents are going to be lacking some of the star players that we're talking about right now and, and making presumptions about right now. The one thing I always try to we always remind ourselves that most teams by December are down a significant number of star players. What do you think the effect is of having those games then? It's a good question. I think the injury concern is, is part of something to think about. And I also think that teams are just 
the truer versions of themselves late in the year. I mean, if you played Jordan, I guess not for the Bears because the Bears defense was terrible early in the season. But if you were a team that had a consistent defense all year and you played Jordan Love in week two or Jordan Love in week 15, things were very different for you. And maybe that's part of the thinking, you know, that we just have a better idea of who these teams are late in the year. And that's when we want the games that matter most because that's not just true for the NFC North. I mean, the AFC North has a lot of those games packed into the back half of the season. So I don't know what the league's thinking is there, but clearly they're trying to lean into that a little bit more with teams all over the league. I would agree with that for sure. I think the best example is the log jam we've seen in the AFC and then it coming down to like the last two weeks and there's always some primetime matchup you're really paying attention to. When it comes to looking at the rest of the league, which I always appreciate your perspective on it, what team intrigues you the most as far as what they've constructed in the offseason and the personnel they may have brought in on the coaching side? It's hard not to think about the Texans and just what that roster looks like now compared to what it looked like even at the end of last year. And you would expect steps forward from them on both offense and defense in year two of a new regime. And then you combine guys like Stefan Diggs, Daniel Hunter, Danico Autry. And they were so aggressive in the moves that they made. It's hard not to get excited about where they are right now. I feel the same way about the Packers, just in the sense that they brought in a new defensive coordinator, and I want to see what that looks like. I think that they're really primed to take a step on offense with what Jordan Love did last year, and just Matt LaFleur really showing what he is as a head coach in a post-Aaron Rodgers world. The defense has consistently held them back, and I think that going to a more aggressive, you know, single-high, one-gap penetrating style with Jeff Halfley, who's their new defensive coordinator, I wonder if that can unlock that group a little bit. And the other team that I just... I feel this drumbeat of excitement because I think that the coach did a really good job last year. I think the quarterback showed some flashes, and I think they have a lot of other pieces in place. I am very excited to watch the Indianapolis Colts play football this year. And I think that Anthony Richardson, there are some moments that you can really grab onto from what he did as a rookie. And that's another team that I think makes the AFC South much more interesting than it was at the beginning of last year when I don't think anybody in America cared about that division. Well, I also appreciate your thoughts on the Falcons at the beginning of last season. And now with their former coach, of course, you know, with Pittsburgh and Justin Fields and obviously Russell Wilson there. What do you think of that? It's a it's strange pairing just because the way that Russell, the way that Arthur Smith wants to play on offense, especially throwing the ball, you know, they want to hammer play action over the middle of the field. And if you look at Justin Fields and Russell Wilson and their history, they typically don't want to attack that area specifically. So stylistically, I'm really curious what that ends up looking like. And the area of that offense I'm most excited about, and this is such a football nerd nonsense answer, is what the run game looks like. Because if you look at the offensive line that Pittsburgh had last season, Broderick Jones you know, comes in, not midseason, but you know, into the year as a rookie to become a starter. He really showed some flashes in the run game. And they added some pieces in the draft with both Zach Frazier and Troy Fontenot that I think could really make that offensive line a strength for this team in a way that it hasn't been in years past. And if they can be an elite rushing offense, you're asking something different of your quarterback than you would if that area is just average or below average. So just what the component parts of that offense look like and how much they need from their quarterback is definitely something I'm going to be paying attention to because I think the defense has a chance to be really good. Robert, please never excuse a football nerd thought or opinion because <laughs> that's why you're here because that's what we want. It's you, what makes the podcast yes, you too. never You never have to excuse uh, your very nature of which you should be proud. I appreciate that. I just lean into it. Yes, thank you. And thanks for your time today. Of course, guys. Anytime. That is thank Robert you. Mays of the Athletic Football Show. And if you're interested in into this sort of thing, he always has an excellent restaurant review. You know, he used, I know it was pinned at the top of his Twitter. I haven't seen his Twitter recently in a while. So, you know, I know some people are hopping off and on the app, but his restaurant recommendation spreadsheet is outstanding. You already gave us one today. You already gave us the, the Kazakhstani restaurant. Chibak Jalou, I really do need.